Good morning, everybody. Well, like the slide says, we'll be talking about facility environmental compliance. And, you know, it's not always about NEPA. I know we always seem to um, gravitate towards some of the NEPA topics when we come to the short course, but Carlos asked me to do something a little different. So I'm going to be talking about um, facility environmental compliance. Um, again, in textile, we tend to think about environmental compliance with either something to do with the NEPA clearance process or uh, something during the construction process, such as compliance with the stormwater permit, maintaining those BMPs. But it's not always about that. In TxDOT, we've got 254 counties, and roughly, roughly speaking, uh, per each county, one per county, we have a maintenance section or a subsection for each of those counties. And then um, we have 25 districts, and then we also have several other facilities. And there's a lot of day-to-day -day operations at those facilities that, that trigger some sort of environmental compliance. And so um, today what I'm going to talk about is some compliance issues that are common at tech stop facilities, what I consider high-risk operations, I'll explain what that means in here in a minute, uh, observations that, that you as a supervisor or manager that might be overseeing some of these facilities you might want to monitor, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about our compliance survey program that we uh, uh, we perform from the division. So these are the areas that we uh, have at our facilities that trigger some kind of environmental compliance. So we've got petroleum storage tank management, wastewater, stormwater runoff, spill prevention control, countermeasure planning, or SPCC, as a lot of people know it about, waste management, waste of all types, used oil, oil filters, antifreeze, lead acid batteries, scrap tire management. If you go to any of these tech stop facilities, you're going to see at least one, but usually all of these types of operations occurring in our maintenance sections or our district complexes. And I'm going to discuss each of these here in a minute, but before I do that, what I've done is I've taken those operations and I've ranked them as sort of risk. And what I mean by risk here is risk of a compliance inspection by a TCQ or EPA inspector. And it's not an official list. What it is, it's just my observation over the years working for TxDOT and seeing what uh, we get inspected for and get fines for. And they're ranked in order here. <clears throat> and by far, by far, petroleum storage tanks are probably our highest risk operation. And then from that, you have wastewater, stormwater management from our facilities, spill prevention control, countermeasure planning. And then under that, waste management, used oil, those things highlighted in brown, they're pretty low risk as far as an inspector coming out and, and checking you out. But they can, though, if you have poor housekeeping, and I'll talk about this a little later, they can jump real high up on the list because somebody might be complaining about the way you're operating facilities, and you'll have an inspector come out and check things out as a result of uh, poor housekeeping practices for those things that are listed in, in, uh, on the bottom. So what I want to do is talk about each of these areas and then uh, things you need to look out for and some things to um, to watch for at those facilities. So petroleum storage tanks, by far, this is our highest compliance risk operation. And this includes uh, underground storage tanks and above ground storage tanks. When it comes to above ground storage tanks, there's really not a lot that you have to do for uh, environmental compliance issues. The compliance for above ground storage tanks is pretty simple. There's not much going on there, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it. But uh, underground storage tanks, <clears throat> that's a much higher compliance risk operation. Um, TxDOT, last, last uh, count that I've heard, we've got over 100 facilities in TxDOT with one or more underground storage tanks. So there's a couple hundred storage tanks, underground storage tanks throughout the state. Uh, and the TCQ, they look at, the one thing about underground storage tanks that's different from an above ground storage tank is that if you have an above ground tank, if it's leaking, it's pretty obvious. You can see it on the ground, you know, it's, it's spilling out of the tank. Underground storage tanks, when it's leaking, you can't really tell. So um, as a result, if they leak, there's a really high risk that they'll impact the groundwater. And that's really what the, the TCQ and the EPA are concerned about is impacts to, to drinking water quality standards. So when you install an underground storage tank, there's all sorts of systems that you put in place and practices that you follow to make sure it's not leaking. So you'll have um, leak detection systems, automatic tank gauging systems. Uh, you have inventory, record keeping, 
inventory control records that you have to keep and maintain. So there's quite a bit of things that you have to maintain and stay on top of for compliance with underground storage tanks. So there's a lot of things that you can get tripped up on. And if you have an underground storage tank, you're going to get inspected. There's a federal requirement that uh, requires states, in, the in this case in Texas, it's the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, TCQ. They're required to inspect underground storage tank facilities at least once every three years. They started that about, I think we're in our second three-year cycle. They started that a few years ago. And uh, what we're seeing as a result of that inspection program is we're seeing about, on average, three to six enforcement actions, meaning they've come out, they've inspected the facility, they found some sort of deficiency, and they're issuing us a notice of violation and a fine. <clears throat> Typically, those fines range from three to $6,000. They're paid out of the district's budgets. Um, the typical things that they cite as far are missing or incomplete UST records, um, improper equipment not being maintained properly, uh, no record of tightness testing. In other words, if you have lines that dis dispense the fuel underground, depending on the type of system you have, you have to do pressure tests to see that it's not leaking. And we, we and sometimes we get tripped up and, and we're not maintaining those records or doing our uh, inspection and testing properly. What you need to know if you're one of these supervisors or managers of these facilities, I put down just some highlights. Again, I'm not going to go into detail. There's a lot of things you need to look at, but these are just some highlights. Do you have trained staff on site? Are they maintaining the inventory control records? <clears throat> know what kind of system you have. Is it a pressure system, a suction system? Is it a steel tank, a fiberglass tank? Those types of things, what type of system you have determines what types of uh, controls you have to maintain and records you have to keep. So. The main thing on this list, though, do you have trained staff? There's a six-hour training course that the ENV um, offers through a contractor that we recommend that at least one operator at a tech stop facility take that class. So there's at least one, we recommend there's at least one trained person at that tech stop facility that's taking this six-hour class. Because what we find, when we find that we go out and we see there's problems or the TCQ's found out there's problems, when we look into it, more often than not, what's happened is the trained staff that were there, the guy that did it for years and years and years, he retired. Or the lady that did it for years and years, she was transferred to another section. Uh, so what happens is nobody picks up the slack, everybody forgets about it, so there'll be a time lag and then the TCQ will come out and they'll do an inspection, they'll ask for those records for that, that period of time that nobody was there. Uh, so typically that's what we're finding is that when somebody leaves nobody's picking up the slack so if you're a supervisor or manager and you're overseeing some of these operations a big thing you can do if somebody leaves the facility see if they're the person that did the UST record keeping and monitoring and if they were make sure somebody's replacing them another program area that we look at is wastewater management also stormwater management's in here too and historically this has been a a pretty big problem for TxDOT <coughs> About 10 or 12 years ago, TCQ did some inspections of some of our facilities. And one of the things they noticed <coughs> was that we're, we weren't managing our wastewater properly. We were doing things such as, for example, uh, we, we would do equipment washing in a wash rack, which is great. But these wash racks were built years ago. They're in the middle of nowhere sometimes. And they'll be plumbed to a sand, they won't be plumbed to a sewer system or a PLTW, they'll be plumbed to a drain field or we often put in what we call disposal wells. So not only was the wastewater going in, not just the, the wash water, but we have sometimes our, our labs with dump chemicals, diesel fuel, whatever, was being dumped in these floor drains or these wash rack drains. And they would go into these leach fields, these drain fields, uh, these uh, disposal wells. Sometimes they were plumbed to a, just a ditch that may lead to a creek. I saw some that were also just you know, wash rack built up next to the, right next to the creek is it real convenient because the water would just go right into the creek. So uh, those were, not, as you can think, they were not really the best way to do things. So uh, TCQ found us, uh, we were in non-compliance, obviously, for those things. So instead of fining us, we negotiated a compliance agreement with them. And um, <clears throat> we didn't get fines, but we were required to upgrade our facilities and also clean up perform corrective action for all those the uh, contamination we caused. So for the last 10 or 12 years, um, we spent millions of dollars upgrading our facilities. We've, um, in some cases, 
um, built new white, new wash racks. In some cases, we've we've plumbed those drain fields to a sanitary sewer system now. If the city allows us to do that, uh, we'll have some kind of collection and containment system on site. Um, <clears throat> or we'll just not perform like equipment washing with we'll contract to do it off site. We've remedied the problem. Um, so we've definitely gotten better over the last 10 or 12 years. We've also had to perform a, quite a bit of corrective action, just that meaning going out, collecting samples, cleaning up contaminated soil and groundwater. We spent a few million doing that. So we, we've made some improvements definitely in the way we manage our wastewater, but there's still some things that we need to watch for. A lot of these maintenance yards, <clears throat> they're old. They built wash racks, but they're designed for like a pickup. They can't really wash a front end loader. So they're not designed for that type of equipment. So the equipment sometimes will still be washed out in the, the yard. And just something if you're, again, you're one of these folks in charge of the, the maintenance yards and overseeing these operations. The key here is not to allow that wastewater from the equipment washing to run off site. If you can contain it on site, we're okay. So if it's just sheet flowing, staying into the yard, and it evaporates, we're all right. Sometimes we'll also recommend that they'll build a, like a wash pad, which is you, you get some old wrap material and you literally just spread it out in the yard, and then the equipment's driven on top of it. They wash it, the, the wash water goes in there, it kind of infiltrates and slowly is regulated or kind of controlled as it's released. They'll do that. Uh, so we've definitely gotten better at it. Uh, other things to think about, it's not so much in the wash water or wastewater area, but it's stormwater issues associated with stockpiles of salt in our winter mix stockpiles. We'll see that there's some pictures there, um, there on the bottom, where you'll have a winter mix pile or a salt pile. It rains, the salt you know, turns to brine, it runs off to site, and then you can find this nice dead vegetation line running around the facility. It's great for weed control, but it doesn't look, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. So what we tell people is um, position your stalk piles. One, if you can, put them under cover. Sometimes uh, a facility may have a salt barn, and I've, I've heard and I've seen some records where we are buying some salt barn facilities. We're going to spread them throughout the state. So we'll get better uh, facilities to manage the salt piles. But if you don't have that, we still recommend uh, if you can cover it. We know that's not the best way because the wind tends to, to knock those tarps off. It's kind of a pain to manage. Other things just to make sure you site the salt pile so it's not in the you know a gully where the, the natural drainage system just goes through the pile. Site it somewhere where it's away from the drainage and put a um, a berm around it so we can collect it and, make, and at least control the water so it's not running off site. So salt pile management that's again some things you need to watch for in uh, stormwater management. <clears throat> Another area spill prevention control and countermeasure that's SPCC. It's an EPA program. Um, basically, it's a program that we have to uh, maintain at our facilities if we have a certain amount of oil, and it can be any type of oil, that's maintained above a certain threshold quantity. And they measure that 55 gallon you, your threshold, you start with 55 gallons. So the trigger is 1,320 gallons. And um, the main reason why we have this program and we have to comply with it at many of our sections is because of our asphalt emulsion tanks. Most of those tanks are like 8,000, 10,000 gallons and we've got uh, probably a couple hundred facilities with, with uh, emulsion tanks that trigger this requirement. So we have quite a few facilities that have to have this program in place and basic is a program where we have plans in place to prevent spills, we have physical controls that we design and install such as containment systems around our tanks. You do monthly inspections to make sure your tanks are in good shape. You make sure your, um, your uh, containment systems are all intact. You have trained staff that you train annually to make sure that they know how to operate the equipment and what to do in the event of a spill. EPA may inspect these facilities. Um, we get, it's not, they don't inspect us very often. In fact, they're not doing, in the last couple of years, they haven't been inspecting us. As far as I know, they haven't inspected us at all. My, my understanding is they're focusing on the oil field industry right now, so they really haven't been messing with TxDOT and some of the other folks. But they have inspected us a few times. A couple of times through the years, it seems to be the average. We, send, we tend to do okay. Uh, if you are an op, uh, a manager or supervisor that oversees some of these facilities, what you need to do is, one, just familiar, familiarize yourself with the plan. Find it. Uh, read through the plan. We, we paid some 
smart engineers, a lot of money to put these plans together for us. And uh, so read through the plans, understand it, be familiar with it. Uh, make sure you have staff on board in your office that are familiar with the plan, they're trained, they know what to do in the event of a spill, they know what kind of inspections they need to do monthly, what kind of record keepings they need to do. Uh, the main thing as far as operations, where the, if there's a risk of a spill, it is our emulsion tank operations. Uh, if we're gonna have a, a big or a major spill, it tends to be associated with our emulsion tanks, and there's a couple of pictures of some uh, spills that have occurred. Um, that top one there, it's, um, it tends to be operator error, or at least the top one was operator error. Somebody was, uh, I don't know what kind of, they were uh, loading the, the emulsion somewhere, somehow. They left, it was a Friday, somebody forgot to turn the valve off, so it drained out through the weekend, uh, and it also rained over the weekend. And so, however, our system worked. The containment system worked. You're, you're required when you design these containment systems to also design enough so that if there's a rain event in the event of the spill also that we uh, contain the rain and the spill and I thought that would never happen but it actually happened on this one so um, it works the, the containment system anyway worked operator error uh, however though um, resulted in the spill waste management recycling um, these are the typical waste management recycling programs that we have TxDOT we've gotten uh, really good at just eliminating a whole lot of our waste streams. We used to, when I first started working here, we had all kinds of stuff that we would generate as far as waste. And through the years, we've done a really good job of just streamlining uh, our operations and getting rid of a lot of waste that we, we generate. Uh, a lot of the waste that we used to generate was associated with the vehicle and equipment maintenance. And TxDOT, we're just not really doing that anymore. We're doing um, most of that equipment maintenance, at least in the sections, and the main, main to charge in the districts, it looks like we're just contracting that service out. We're not doing that in the yards anymore. So that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing a lot of the waste generation that we used to see. Uh, but we still have a little bit of it. And when we do, though, we typically have a contractor or a vendor take care of it for us. And the main thing that to, to think about if you're in charge of one of these facilities is to um, look at the contract that you have with your vendor or your contract and see what it says. It, and they should be following what the contract says. Essentially, if you're picking up waste as a contractor, there's two, two big things you got to do, at least from our standpoint on record keeping, is a record showing that you picked it up, how much you picked up, and what you picked up. And then another record showing it went somewhere and was disposed of properly or was uh, recycled properly. And you can reconcile. They picked it up, and we figured out where it went to. Sometimes when we do some of our, um, our surveys or inspections internally, We'll look at those record, records, and we can see when we picked it up, and we can see when we paid them, but we can't really figure out where it went. And um, it takes a little effort. Usually we do find out, but um, sometimes we don't. And sometimes, uh, particularly one of the issues is on um, scrap tires. It seems to be a challenge sometimes to find a good vendor to pick those up. Um, that seems to be, if there's an issue in that area, it's scrap tire management. And the, the TCQ has a whole manifesting system for making sure those scrap tires get from our facility to a proper disposal or recycling facility. And sometimes we don't see that, that rec those records are being maintained properly. Another thing to think about, <clears throat> at least as far as waste management, recycling, <clears throat> is uh, complaints from neighbors. That's what usually triggers some sort of problem in these areas. TxDOT, you know, we built our maintenance sections years ago. They're on the edge of town. Nobody lived there. Time passes and everybody builds their houses around us because we're out in the country and it's a beautiful place and they want to live in there, but they don't like TxDOT as a neighbor anymore. So they'll call and they'll complain. They don't like the noise. They don't like the smell or something. So if they call and make a complaint to the TCQ, the TCQ, they're obligated to go out and investigate that complaint. So they will show up. And if they show up, they, they you know, they're there. They want to find something. So, um, and they, they'll look for things. And if they, some of the things that are, that are easy, low hanging fruit for them are just poor housekeeping issues. And I got some pictures of some things up here that we've seen that that could bring the attention to, a, to an inspector. And if you notice, there's a, there's a kind of a theme there, and it's drums. Everybody thinks drums. If it doesn't have a label on it, it's got you know something deadly in it. So if you have a drum, the best thing is just get rid of it. And so if you have them, just get rid of them, recycle them. Nobody likes drums. Uh, spills, minor spills. Uh, really sloppy tires, you know, scrap tires or just piles of trash, just get rid of those things. Those will um, go a long way 
and preventing an inspection. So if you're one of these maintenance supervisors or, or an air, area engineer, director of operations, director of maintenance, occasionally go out and just walk the yards and see what it looks like. And if you see problems or just bad housekeeping, just, just have them corrected. <coughs> so that kind of leads me into our uh, facility survey program. And what this is, is what we've done this for many, many years. Um, I've been here 16 years. They had started this program or something like it before I even got here. And basically what we do is we go out from the division and do our, uh, basically we call them surveys. That's a softer term than inspections. So we go out and we do our inspections or surveys and see how the districts are doing as far as compliance with all these, those program areas that I just talked about. Um, and again, it's just to verify the effectiveness of how well those programs are going. It provides feedback two ways. One, we get to go out as a division and see how well our guidance and instructions and training is being communicated to the districts. And if it's not, if something's not working right, we can look at our training and guidance and see is there something that we need to do at the division level to improve the way we're communicating, the way this, you know, how to make things work right. So it's a two-way street. Uh, it's an overview of the many programs we talked about. Uh, there's. You can go into a lot of depth and detail reviewing different things, but typically we don't have the time for that, so we're just doing an overview of the different programs that I talked about. But sometimes, though, we do spotlight one particular program, and we'll just spend all our time there looking at those pro that particular program. And, and one that comes to mind is underground storage tanks. We've done that before. Uh, before the TCQ started their three-year inspection cycle, we went out to all the facilities that, that we could get to that had underground storage tanks and either trained staff or went to each of those facilities and showed them what to look for. So we've done, uh, we've spotlighted certain programs, but for the most part, we do an overview. Uh, the frequency, it's about every 18 to 24 months. It's not a, it's not a rigid schedule. And the main thing is because it's, it's historically been a kind of a secondary program or priority program in our, our section. Uh, our primary function is to support project development, the construction side of the house. So if we have time and staffing and travel allows us, we, we do get out to the districts and do the surveys, but it hasn't historically been a priority program. We're making some changes and some organization and staffing so that we are gonna, gonna make some, uh, trying to make it more of a priority program, do it on a regular frequency. There's some changes that we're seeing in the regulatory uh, environment that's gonna really facilitate the need for a more uh, standard, uh, frequent, inspection program so we are making some changes but for and the, historically it's been more of a secondary uh, role that we've played every 18 to 24 months again is when we did it um, we don't hit every section don't have time to sometimes uh, sometimes we'll just hit a representation of a few sections usually we'll see some trends which tells us you know what's probably happening at the sections we're not going to again these are the program areas we cover I just talked about those uh, the survey procedures, we let people know well in advance, several weeks in advance that we're coming. We'll usually tell them what facilities we're going to. Uh, we give them a copy of our checklist. We have a standard checklist that we use. And uh, so they can take the checklist and go out and do their own surveys or ins inspections before we get there. When we get to the district on the day we're scheduled to be there, we usually do a briefing with the, uh, the district management, tell them what we're doing, tell them what sections we're going to, an uh, overview of, of what we'll be doing while we're there. Uh, then when we go to each of the different sections, we'll visit with the section supervisor or the, op, uh, the, the office manager, if whoever's there, it's usually just the office manager. And we'll go through the, what we're gonna do, they'll walk the yard with us, we'll go through the checklist with them, we'll, we'll note and let them know when we find deficiencies, if we can make spot changes or corrections on site, we'll do that. Um, before we leave, we'll let them know, you know what we've seen and what things they need to make changes. Anytime we make a, a a citation or like we've observed some something that there's a problem it's usually because it's, it's a reference to a specific environmental standard and this is just a, I know you can't read this but it's a copy or page out of our checklist and that that uh, left hand column there it's the areas that we're looking at like SPCC program or used oil or S or underground storage tanks and we'll describe what it is that we're looking for and what's the standard that you have to have that we're looking for? And the standard is usually a direct reference to a regulatory citation. So we're usually just pulling the regulation, seeing what it says, and using that as a standard for compliance. And that's what we tell the districts. If there's not a regulatory reference, we'll just describe or we'll give them a best management practice, and that, that's included on these checklists too. Um, at the end of the 
survey. We'll do an outbriefing with the district management, let them know what we found. We also go back to the office and prepare a formal report. Each report has um, a finding for each section. This is a, this is a copy out of one of the reports. Uh, it'll list the area that we reviewed where we found something that was deficient. It lists again that standard, that regulatory uh, reference, and then that's the corrective action that they're, that's the standard that they have to meet for the corrective action. If there's any other observations or comments, we include that on the uh, report there again there's a this is a page out of each of the of a this looks like the El Paso yeah the El Paso district and there's a for each section that we went to that we found deficiencies there'll be a page like this uh, what we do when we give the districts we give this to the districts we ask them to go through the report and then um, make uh, corrective actions for each of those areas that we found that were deficient and then also document what it is that they did for the corrective action and we give them we call it a district response report form so that for that facility where we found a deficiency we told them what the deficiency is and then we give them an opportunity there to write that, that section there uh, what corrective actions they took and then that's a record that they can keep on file to show that not only did we find the problem but they corrected the problem and I think that's it so that's that's an overview of some, kind of something different, you know, not the, the NEPA world. Um, it's an overview of the programs that we look at in our maintenance sections and then uh, the compliance survey program that TxDOT has at, at the division that we help districts out as far as looking at what they're doing, how well they're doing. So that, that's all I had. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.